to ask one young one question uh, about two things, counter selection and uh, uh, heterogeneity in the population, even if it's the same species when you begin. So you mentioned you can select naturally or artificially um, before you begin the experiment, but you could also take the community and then mutate it to introduce large amount of variation. And also have a counter selection measure in case they're doing things you don't want them to do. So you can really set up the whole game so that it goes towards the direction you want it to go. Have, have you thought about yeah, that? Yeah, correct. Because actually there's a major challenge right, for doing this is the, the ability to select, right, artificial selection itself. I kind of glossed it over, but think about that. If a community function is a product that has no color, right, unless you're selecting just from hundreds of communities, you can do HPLC mass spec. How would you select if you really need millions of communities? You will have to have a very rapid assay for community function. Right, so for counter selection, you will even need more assays to counter select things you don't want, like the byproduct. They can make the product and the useless product. Ideally, for example, you want to select on high product but the low byproduct, the byproduct in the, the derivatives of that product that's useless. And then you need even more bioassays, more assays that would allow you to do selection and counter selection. So I think in general, it's a very challenging problem. I might follow up just with a question as well. Um, in studies of the microbiome, either in humans or experimental animals, we have situations where there's a perturbation. Let's say an antibiotic is, is given. So if we assume that all the resources are being used at a given time, and now it's perturbed, and now there are different trajectories of... Very right. Of, Correct. The landscape, yes. La things go down, now things come back at different rates. I wonder if we could, one could use many of these experiments to develop a model for what are some of the uh, uh, cooperativities, some of the competition, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting, um, very interesting suggestion. So, so far we have been limiting to two species because even understanding this is hard. We're already collapsing 3D to 2D trying to understand what's going on. But it'd be very interesting to see if you go to multi-species, of many species communities, right, and then resource depletion versus non-depletion, how would that play out in this heritable part which we want and the non-heritable part which would confuse us from selection? So actually, I don't have an answer for that question. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. This is for Dr. Blazer. Uh, I, I won't say I enjoyed your talk. I'm a, I'm a new father, and so you kind of made me very paranoid now about all of the damage I've already done to my son. Uh, and also, my name is Martin Shelton. I'm a postdoc uh, here at ISB. Uh, but I, I was wondering, you talked about um, fecal transplants as uh, a potential um, mitigator of, of kind of early, the early harm that, you know, you could do to a child. I was wondering, are there other um, things? Do you think diet uh, plays a role or can, can be mitigating uh, a mitigating factor. I don't know if you may have showed this data and I might have missed it, but have you looked at, you know, uh, in your animal studies when you don't give a high fat diet, but instead give a normal diet, is there, or, or maybe a low fat diet, um, were, was there any, uh, any effect on that as far as mitigating the, the initial effects of uh, disrupting the microbiome? Yeah, so <clears throat> congratulations on fatherhood. Uh, I think there are a couple of things to say. First is that diet has has a, a big effect, a big transient effect on the microbiome. Uh, when you put in a new food substrate, you you alter the uh, you alter the selective landscape, and the microbiome responds very rapidly. There have been studies in both mice and humans to show this. Now, you know, one of the questions is. So how fundamental is that change? Has the overall properties of the community changed or just been perturbed and then at a certain point they'll go, go down? And that, that issue of uh, diet and, and perturbation is, is an important frontier. Now the other question uh, you asked is about the, um, the, the restoration of the, um, the perturbed microbiome in babies. And I'm, I'm not recommending fecal transplant for babies, just so it's very clear. Although it's conceivable that it's until we get to the point where we really understand what's going on, it's conceivable that parents will stockpile the poop of their kids 
and maybe when they have get, have to be on an antibiotic for some reason, maybe they'll restore it. I mean, that that makes some in, intrinsic sense. Whether it's it's correct or not, I don't know. But I think we need to think about uh, the different kinds of damage that we're doing uh, uh, to the developing microbiome during this critical window in early life and, and begin to think of approaches. Uh, there will be chemical substrates that, that are favored foods for certain bacteria. And once we understand exactly who the good guys are, maybe we can uh, supplement them. In fact, that's what nature does. Uh, 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 many of these uh, saccharides in human milk are indigestible by humans. They are only digestible by bacteria, and they are not uh, universally digestible. They're digestible by bacteria that have certain enzymes. And interestingly, these coincide with many of the organisms we think of as beneficial. So nature's doing it already, we're, we're, but formula is not. Of I stand Cohen. Uh, you very tellingly demonstrated the impact of even very early perturbation of the of the microbiome. <clears throat> but that's sort of a done deal. We have hundreds of millions of people who already have made that had that mistake done to them. What data is there on the impact of the preservatives, which are preservatives because they interfere with microbial function, and the feeding of antibiotics to livestock? What is there data on the continued impact of eating preservative and antibiotic-laden food on the human microbiome? Uh, so, to the degree I heard you, uh, uh, the, the the question was about uh, people are, are are being exposed to antibacterials all the time, uh, uh, triclosan and the toothpaste. Uh, uh, residual antibiotics in foods of animal origin where the animals are fed antibiotics. Uh, what's the impact of that on the microbiome? I think it's a great question. It's hardly been studied at all, uh, and it needs to be studied. And, and uh, uh, recently there were some articles from China about finding uh, um, detectable levels of antibiotics in drinking water in major cities like Shanghai. So. The question is, what, what's, the, what's the consequence of that? I think it's much worse in a place like China where antibiotic use is so much greater on the farm and in humans than it is here. But it, this is unstudied in the U.S. And, and needs to be studied. I agree. Um, so great session. Thank you so much. For me, it's also a little bit more uh, from Professor Blazer I want to hear, but it's a technology question, so please. Um, all those point out that it's very important to have even a consumer product that someone can do its own study about what is good for me and my diet or not and how does this affect. So um, behind all these beautiful results you saw, it's a very tedious pipeline with sequencing, with high-level bioinformatics. How you can see this can become cheap um, so we can sequence faster, uh, people can, and as I said, even like a consumer product, do you have something in your mind for the future or not? Yeah, I mean, firstly, it's not just going to be sequencing. Sequencing is, is perhaps necessary but not sufficient. It's also going to be metabolomics to understand what are the, what are the small molecules. It's going to be gene expression in the host, not just uh, in the mi microbial gene expression, host gene expression. It's a multi-dimensional problem. And exactly how we're going to tackle it, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly we'll get some clues from microbial sequences. Uh, we should get clues from biomarkers uh, in, in, in children, whether they're plasma or urine or fecal biomarkers. It's a young field. We're, we're, it's a, we're at a scientific frontier. You can kind of get the, see kind of the vague outlines, but there are a lot of details that has to be filled in so that it can be applied. Uh, you, Jeff, Jeff Plan, uh, Personalized Lifestyle. Oh, did, excuse me, did you want to? Yeah, I just wanted please. to follow up yes. one thing. I think excuse me. Uh, one of the things that, um, from the work that Manyan described, the type of work that 
one would need to do to get at the mechanistic and causal basis of some of these associations. I think would require us also systems where we can harvest the samples and culture them in an authentic way in the, in the laboratory. So there are no suitable systems right now to be able to do that. Even getting microbial communities from soil and bringing them and maintaining their structure and function is extremely challenging. And so that's, that's a field that really needs to be driven forward with some technological advancements and uh, some breakthroughs are necessary there. Otherwise, we'll always be kind of working with correlations and uh, it'll be difficult to interpret what those mean. Yeah, I have a um, comment to add as well. That's actually what's the motivation that motivated our kind of work. So would community selection work if you, are, you do not know what's going on? How likely it is going to work, right? Because if it's independent of mechanisms or interactions, and if you're careful about A, B, C, D, if you satisfy all these criteria, maybe it would work. Then we'll provide a complementary, sort of like um, top-down kind of approach, right, to, to modulating community property or activity. You know, one approach to combine some, some of this is to work with germ-free animals and now populate them with small consortia, two organisms, three, five organisms, not hundreds or thousands, and now work with the modelers to understand what are the active principles. But you have to, you, you, probably you'll need multidimensional redacts, uh, in, including metabolic and, and genetic. Uh, Jeff Bland, Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute. Um, I love the three of you speaking together. I think it is the embodiment of systems biology in a very complex world in which we live, and all three of you interconnected beautifully to a question that I'm, I know is an impossible question to answer, but I'd like to get your thinking because you're clear thought leaders. So in this complex uh, multi-ecological community that we call the microbiome, you have all sorts of different metabolic principles. You can divide these bacteria into maybe three categories into, into um, those that are favorable for the gut, those that are commensal, and then those are parasitic, and you can say they have different personalities as it relates to their metabolic archetypes. And uh, so you might turn this uh, story around from a systems perspective, rather than look at the speciation, look at the effects of the community and start asking questions about what are the effects on the phenotype of the, of the host organism that are most uh, interesting to model? Would it be uh, toll-like receptor 4 activation through lipopolysaccharides? Would it be short-chain fatty acids that interrelate with uh, complementary effects on the enterocyte? And, and there is a, a, a wide body of literature that's developing around phenotypic analysis of the effect of the community personality of your microbiome. And I'm wondering if, if we might not model this from the other side, rather than from the species population, from the phenotypic side of the effect on the human, and ask how does their environment then, uh, which I know has been done, there's a study in Israel, and there, there are others that have been looking at this, but uh, putting the three of you together, it seems like there might be another way of strategically modeling in the individual, how their diet and their lifestyle and the factors that influence them would affect the phenotypic outcome of this community to form a steady state of health rather than that of disease. Do, am I making sense to you in, in where I'm asking here, or have I lost you along my question? Go first. Well, you go first. <laughs> well, I'll start. Uh, so first, you, you talk about organisms being favorable or unfavorable. And uh, about 60 years ago, a microbial ecologist named Theodore Rosebery came up with a concept that he called amphibiosis. And that was a biological state of uh, parasitism or symbiosis uh, that was determined by context. And what that means is that an organism could be beneficial at one point and harmful at another point. We, we see this in the mouth. We have uh, alpha streptococci which help protect against the beta streptococci, but they also can cause infection on our heart valves. So there's, there's always a cost to a biological relationship, and it may vary uh, over time and context. So it, it gets actually more difficult. And in, in terms of your question about phenotype, I think the answer is gonna be uh, what phenotypes are you interested in, and the markers are gonna be different. And it seems unlikely that there will be a single marker that will be important for important phenotypes, whether it's obesity or, or, or diabetes or asthma, uh, but more likely a group of, 
of markers. That increases the complexity, but these are complex phenotypes. Well, and, and Marty, I think you're speaking exactly to what I'm saying. It seems that we have at least a hypothesis of what some of these phenotypic biomarkers might be that form a subset of metabolic regulatory factors that are at these network uh, uh, centers that, that control function. And it may be that by assembling the right panel of these in a systems approach that you can start to interrogate these relationships from the, from the backside up is what, I'm, is what I'm suggesting. That's certainly the hope. Hi, Jennifer Lovejoy from Aerovale. Really nice uh, symposium. It was really incredible. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, my question is really for the whole panel, and in a way, as a follow-up to to Jeff's question, um, Nitin, I was really intrigued by your experimental data and a, a comment that you made about how the collapse of the community, um, in paraphrasing here, in essence happened when the internal uh, cellular milieu was no longer appropriately correlated with the external environment um, when you were doing your environmental manipulations. And from a clinical research perspective, we really talk a lot about the same thing happening with some of our current chronic disease epidemics, particularly obesity. And so um, there is speculation at least that obesity is occurring at the rate it is not only because of microbial changes but in many ways our current physiology is not adapted to the rapid changes in the food environment the physical activity environment and other aspects of our modern life so I, I'm curious to get the panelists perspective on you know kind of making that leap from the micro to the macro um, and thinking about experimental design and what might be ways that we could design Design experiments at the the organism level, and particularly at the at the clinical or human level, to actually start to test some of these hypotheses about environmental manipulation and the impact on on phenotype in this regard. Great question, thank you. So the term the the phenomenon you're referring to that I mentioned is called relational resilience, and it's a general systems property. It's not just microbes, but any complex system tends to have this property where you have a relationship between the internal state of the system with the external environmental conditions. And we've observed this not just in, in, in bacteria, but also in diatoms in the ocean, where uh, when you have ocean acidification, you have some issues there with uh, th these primary producers. So we looked at their resilience in the system. And when you typically look at these properties, people tend to look at um, steady state behaviors. So you look at how does the diatom do at low carbon versus high carbon? Or how does this microbial community do uh, with um, low amounts of nutrients or high amounts of nutrients? When in reality, what you're looking at is their cap capability to respond and recover from stress. And this applies to humans as well. So when we think of healthy or disease, we tip, we, we're looking for a endpoint. So at, at a given point, is that individual in a healthy state or a disease state, the way we, we've defined it quantitatively. You cannot predict risk often just from those measurements. And a great example is the cardiac stress test, where if someone has high risk for cardiac disease, you put them on a treadmill and make them run and observe the response, uh, response and recovery of their heart dynamics. And that tells you whether there are signatures of high risk for cardiac disease. The, the resting state measurements do not tell you whether there's so, in, if if I were to make a leap and say what we should be doing, it's all, already being done in the human system, where we know that certain measurements made at resting state or equilibrium do not necessarily tell you about what the future health of that individual might look like. And the same is true for microbial communities as well. Is looking at how an individual's community structure and function changes over the day-night cycle in, in um, response to different types of diets, etc. I think from that, we might be able to begin to get some understanding of this relational resilience, whether the system is uh, in flux, is it stable, or is it unstable and about to collapse? And those types of metrics might be possible because we can make the measurements now. So the experiment design would be, like you guys are doing, longitudinal measurements, but the frequency of measurements and the context in which they're made are going to be very critical in evaluating resilience and health. Oh, no, I have this, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but it should go. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to make one other comment, and that is uh, about the uh, 
the, the maladaptation that is leading to these modern diseases, um, th these have happened in a, a period of decades. So it's, it's, the question is, what's the natural selection going to be? What's going to happen to humankind over, over the centuries or millennia? Will uh, children who have asthma when they're young, will they ha reproduce as much? Will they have as many babies, S similar with obesity and diabetes? I don't think we know the answers yet. Uh, we, we, could, we could guess about it. But these, these changes, which are occurring on a global level, uh, um, have occurred at a time when longevity has been going up. And the question is, will it keep going up, will it flatten, or will it go down? Uh, very quick uh, practical question. Uh, it might help Martin's son. Uh, does parental antibiotics affect the microbiome? Like antibiotic, yeah, IV. Yeah. Um, it depends on the antibiotic uh, because there is an enterohepatic circulation of many antibiotics so that it goes through the liver, into the bile, into the intestine. On average, parenteral should affect less than oral. And certain oral antibiotics are very well absorbed and don't reach the colon. Some are less well absorbed. So there, there's variation. It's, it's, it's hardly been studied, and it should be studied. That, that, that may be an approach uh, for pediatrics. Uh, uh, more shots and less pills. <laughs> <laughs> Found to be very popular. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm uh, Rishikesh Bargaze. I'm a postdoc at uh, ISB as well. And my question is to you mostly, uh, Dr. Blazer. Um, you kind of had a really nice uh, story about how uh, antibiotics or the gut microflora can affect the immune system. I was just curious about if somebody has looked at uh, onset of allergies, and is there any correlation between the gut microflora and uh, the incidences of allergies? And uh, are there ways to identify correlation versus causation in uh, onset of allergies? So there, there's... There's a large and growing body of work about microbiota and allergies and asthma, uh, both. And allergies include food allergies. And the data come in different forms. There are experimental models that uh, are similar to ours, indicating that the microbiota are important in immunologic development. I mean, it's, it's a, there are many, many recent citations. Also, there are epidemiologic studies looking at antibiotic exposure and allergy and asthma, finding positive associations. One of the most interesting epidemiologic studies that, that I've seen uh, are two studies from Finland. In the first study, the investigators were interested in allergy to milk, common allergy. And because the records in Finland are, and in other Scandinavian countries are so great, they were able to identify 15,000 children in Finland who had had milk allergy over, diagnosed over, let's say, a 10-year period. And they matched them with 15,000 children who did not have milk allergy. And they asked six questions of importance to me. Uh, and the answer to all six was yes. And so the first question is, did the kids who had milk allergy get exposed to antibiotics more than the kids who didn't? They're matched controls. And the answer was yes. The second question was, was there a dose response? The answer was yes. The third question is, did their mothers take more antibiotics during pregnancy than the mothers of the other kids? The answer was yes. Was there a dose response? Yes. And the fifth question is, did the mothers take more antibiotics in the year before pregnancy? And that was yes and also yes. And they did that study for milk allergy, and they did that study for asthma, and the results are quite similar. It's all consistent with this idea of the intergenerational transfer of the microbes and the development of the early life microbiota. I should have a question um, for you, right? So you showed very strikingly how the diversity declined over time. Well, Do you let me just say, in the citation, the, the First author of those papers is Metsala, M-E-T-S-A-L-A, in the journal Epidemiology. Right, so I'm curious, because you showed a very striking diagram, right, of how the diversity of microbiota declined over a period of, I don't remember, years. Right, so do you understand, I mean, based on sort of like a back of envelope calculation, would you be able to understand this rate of decline? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. First, um, uh, these are, um, these are cross-sectional data. They're not longitudinal oh, data. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, compare, we're, I'm trying to draw inferences by, right. from the different societies. But the, we began working on this because we were studying Helicobacter, uh, which has been declining. And, and we, can, we can measure the rate of decline. Interestingly, the decline in Helicobacter began before the introduction of antibiotics. So uh, there are factors other than antibiotics oh. that are propelling So that decline is not due to antibiotic treatment of H. pylori? Oh, no, not at oh, all. Oh, I see. Not at all. That's, that happened much later. The decline was well underway before that. Oh, that's interesting. It's because of many aspects of modern life, including clean water, which clean water is one of the great parts of modern civilization, uh, but it may have uh, uh, some unintended consequences. So I have a question for you. So the effect of antibiotics is probably because of their broad-based antibiotics that kill large groups of organisms and not as targeted. So do you have any comments on the next generation of antibiotics being more targeted using CRISPR-based systems or along those lines? So uh, I, I think that one of the solutions will be narrow-spectrum antibiotics. Up to now, the whole thrust of antibiotic discovery has been broad, to find broad-spectrum antibiotics that work against everything. But now that we're appreciating the collateral damage from antibiotics, ideally, we should begin to develop narrow-spectrum antibiotics uh, that will require improved diagnostics so that we'll be able to tell exactly which organism is present. Uh, and now we can use all the genomic information that we have. In theory, it should be easier to develop narrow-spectrum antibiotics than broad-spectrum because the target is so much smaller. And we have all this genomic information. So um, I, I would guess some years from now, maybe 20 years from now, there'll, there'll be 40 antibiotics, one for pseudomonas and one for staph and one for strep, and et cetera, or maybe combinations. And that's we'll have the diagnostics that will tell us, does a person have this microbe or not? And then we will use that, that diagnostic. That, that, that requires a lot of development. Uh, and there's no economic model for that. <laughs> there's no economic model for any of this because our, our whole pipeline is uh, flawed. I mean, there's, there's one technology that Tim Liu at MIT developed which could which may help here, where you have a CRISPR-based system that just targets specifically a specific microbe that you want to target. Uh, of course, delivery of that in a way that is accessible to where the microbe has infected you is, is a question, but that certainly allows you to look at very specific genomic uh, signatures for the microbe you're targeting, and then just have your guide RNAs go and kill that specific microbe. So. I think that we'll be able to pre-design these antibiotics for group A strep, for staph, for E. coli, et cetera, based on commonalities. And maybe, maybe it will be more complex than that, but that they, those will be available. And so when somebody comes in and the rapid diagnosis is made that they have an infection with that organism, uh, then it can be employed. And an important aspect is, of course, the differentiation between bacterial infection and viral infection. We have many of those tools now, but they're not being applied. One, one more. This question is uh, for Dr. Xu. I, I really appreciated the model you offered. It contained psychometry, kinetics, evolution. What I was looking forward to also hearing is your thoughts on how do you model resistance? What, what types of shocks could you apply to your model? to uh, get to some theories about resistance in your communities? Um, resilience, you mean? Resilience. The, like what the team yes, was talking yes, about. Yes, yes. So this is actually this, um, this is a great question. This is actually, as you pointed out, it's a, the first bottleneck one would have to overcome. For two species, have, we have a pretty good idea about how you could have them coexist. Basically, what's coexistence, right? It's all species achieve, on average, the same fitness, same growth rate. So for two species, it's easy to do. It's actually not clear how one would go about it do for multi-species. And it's even more striking because theory predicts if you know, different species compete for the shared resource, there's competitive exclusion principle. Only one species can exist. 
And, uh, and uh, um, if you want to increase species coexistence, you would have to have a spatially structured environment that can promote um, diversity. But people have recently been doing experiments where they just use well-mixed environment to do enrichment culture, and they can consistently see coexistence of multiple six, seven species. And we still do not understand why they would, um, they would coexist. And uh, understanding mechanisms, as we know, is not, not, not trivial. But I think that, that in the future, it's definitely possible to have multi, say, five or more species, right, that could be stable that could stably coexist in at least the environment that you have been working on. But then there's the next question. So suppose you, put, you administer to a human being, whether it would be able to overcome the resilience of the native uh, microbiota and be able to persist in the environment you want them to persist. That's an entirely different question again. So I, this definitely there are a lot of opportunities for future research. Well, that brings up, it's about time to wrap up. So. Thank you, both speakers. Please join me in, uh, in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. I love your talk. Thank you.